The committee reports progress. Well done, Senator Bernardi. It being almost 2 p.m., we will go to questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Yeah. Labor is deeply concerned about the Turkish military operation targeting to Kurds in northern Syria and has called on Turkey to cease unilateral action. We are already seeing that the operation is further destabilising the region, worsening the humanitarian disaster in Syria and risks undermining progress against Daesh. Can the minister update the Senate on the situation in northern Syria and advise what action the Australian government has taken? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Wong for her question. Uh, as uh, the Senate and uh, the, uh, the Leader would appreciate, uh, this is a very fast evolving and very dangerous situation. Uh, both the Prime Minister and I have made it uh, very clear in our statements that uh, the Turkish military action has grave consequences for regional security. Uh, amongst other things, it will significantly undermine the gains that have been made by the international coalition in our fight against uh, Daesh. And without question, Daesh continues to be a serious threat to regional peace and security, despite its territorial defeat. It will certainly cause additional civilian suffering. It will lead to greater population displacement, and it will further inhibit the access of international organisations to those who are in need of international humanitarian support. But, uh, Mr. President, uh, the State Minister also asked uh, in relation to, uh, to Australia's engagement. Uh, before the incursion actually commenced, and as a clear response to the announcements being made by Turkey, I issued a statement on 8 October uh, urging restraint by all parties to the conflict in Syria calling for all involved to avoid escalatory actions and opportunistic actions that would cause further instability and add to humanitarian suffering. I directed the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to make Australia's views plain to the Turkish ambassador in Canberra uh, and in Ankara indeed. Last week, the Prime Minister spoke to French President Macron, and on the weekend, the Prime Minister and I have both spoken with US Secretary of State Pompeo. Uh, to um, discuss the situation with Turkey and in Syria. Yesterday I spoke to uh, my counterpart, the Turkish Foreign Minister, in a detailed and wide-ranging telephone discussion, uh, repeating Australia's concerns, urging restraint uh, and indicating the severe impact that this would have on the regional security situation and the security situation more broadly. Yeah. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Uh, I, I thank the Minister for her um, outline of what the government has done. Uh, uh, whilst the military action has been launched by Turkey, it has been enabled by the decision of the Trump administration to withdraw US forces from northern Syria. I understand from her answer that uh, representations have been made to the Secretary of State. Could the minister advise what representations were made to the US about the impact of its decision to withdraw forces from northern Syria? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I think it's, it's very important to be clear about where responsibilities lie in relation to the impact of these military actions. Turkey is responsible for the decisions it has made in conducting this incursion. Turkey is totally accountable for the actions of its military forces and the militia groups it is employing. They are responsible for the humanitarian suffering they are causing through their military operations, and they are accountable for the detention, custody and escape uh, of any Daesh fighters. Our discussions with the United States uh, concerned uh, these issues and more, Mr President, but it is not my habit, as you know and as the Senate knows, to go into the contents of those private discussions. Senator Wong, final supplementary question. Reports indicate thousands of Daesh or ISIS fighters were being held. Order at the rear of the chamber. Voice. Senator Wong, please start again. I lost track of the question. Order at the rear of the this chamber. Is... Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Reports indicate that thousands of Daesh or ISIS fighters were being held by Kurdish led forces in northern Syria. What is the government's assessment of the consequences for the fight against Daesh of both the Turkey military action and the US decision to withdraw from the region? Senator Payne. 
Uh, as I said in my uh, uh, remarks in my response to Senator Wong's first question, Mr. President, we are very concerned about the impact that this uh, military action by Turkey will have on the fight and campaign against Daesh. We know that we have achieved a territorial defeat of Daesh, and that is broadly accepted. But we also know, and Australia most particularly recognises, given the vulnerabilities in our own region, uh, that Daesh is more than capable of, uh, of um, small bursts of or large bursts of energy and activity and continuing uh, terrorist and violent extremist activity, not just in the Middle East but uh, allied with uh, other extremist organisations in our region and more broadly. So any action that enables their activity, that enables that engagement, is of concern to Australia. Senator Davey. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Um, Minister, can you please inform the Senate as to how the Liberal and National government is supporting farmers and communities across Australia who are currently experiencing prolonged and devastating drought? Minister and how Day. is the government building resilience against future droughts? My apologies. The Minister for Agriculture, Senator D McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Davey, for your question. I know it is something near and dear to your heart as uh, a senator who bases herself out in regional New South Wales, where so many of our farmers are struggling with the drought. The Liberal National Government continues to stand with our farmers and regional communities uh, as they struggle with the ongoing drought. We know heading into summer uh, the rain signs are not great, and that is why we're taking immediate action in the here and now, but we're also assisting communities and the agricultural sector more broadly to prepare for the future. Support in times of hardship is part of what is needed to help farmers and their communities through these difficult times, which is why uh, on the 27th of September, with Minister for um, Drought, Minister Littleproud, the Prime Minister and I headed out to David Gooding's farm in Dalby to announce an additional $100 million worth of support to our drought-affected communities, radically simplifying the farm household allowance, its application policy, uh, its ac application process and its key policy settings, resuming the Drought Community Support Initiative, which puts $3,000 cash into the hands and onto the kitchen tables of these farm farming families, and extending the Drought Communities Program, making sure that 13 additional local councils can access $1 million to build local projects and therefore employ locals. For those here and now uh, perspectives, we've got the Farm Household Allowance, additional rural financial councillors, the Community Support Initiative, important mental health services, wellbeing support, concessional loans and generous, ta generous taxation measures. Secondly, uh, there are broader measures in the medium term. And thirdly, programs to assist the long-term resilience and preparedness, including our $5 billion future drought fund. The message to farmers in their communities across Australia is very clear. We know that times are tough, but we will stand with you now and through the recovery. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. How will the changes that we've put through, changes to the farm household allowance, how will that benefit and make it easier for farmers experiencing hardship to receive support from this government? Order during questions. Senator McKenzie. Very hard. Thank you, Mr President. The farm household allowance was, was created with strong bipartisan support. In fact, it was actually an initiative of the Labor Party, although they only established FHA for three years in any given lifetime of a farmer. Since its introduction in 2014, over $350 million in FHA payments have been made to over 12,500 farmers and their partners going through financial hardship. On 10 September, our government uh, announced an independent review into the farm household allowance, and our response is being enacted uh, on receiving that review and will be passing legislation through this place in coming uh, weeks and months to ensure that our farmers have that radical simplification of the farm household allowance that they've been calling for, including a simplified asset test, including changing the time limit from four years in total to four in ten years. Order. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. And finally, Minister, as the drought is ongoing and uh, as it bites harder, what are the risks to both the agricultural sector and our broader communities 
if we do not assist this sector and uh, the flow on value add. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Our government recognising that farming in Australia is a long game and that governments can't make it rain. But what matters at the moment is that some of our farmers can't put food on their own table, which is ironic because they're putting food on everyone else's table and clothes on our back. Support in times of hardship is exactly what's needed to help our farmers and their communities through these difficult times. And supporting our drought-affected farmers and communities remains our government's number one priority, which is why we've committed over $7 billion in programs. The wealth of our entire nation is generated across regional Australia. So it's not just these communities that are doing it tough, but it's estimated that up to $12 billion will be the hit to our national economy as a, uh, because of the, the drought. Our farmers feed people across Australia as well as millions across the Row, uh, world. I and the rest of the government welcomed bipartisan support for drought measures, particularly around the farm household Order. allowance. I hope that Senator continues. McKenzie. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. In an embarrassing leak of the Prime Minister's speaking instructions for government members, Oops. it was revealed the Prime Minister's office is boasting that the government has, and I quote, a plan for an even stronger economy. Why then has Deloitte Access Economics order. today pointed order. out? Sorry, pause, Senator Sheldon. Order on my right. I have a sense that I may need to hear the exact nature of this question. Senator Sheldon, please continue from why. Why then has Deloitte Access Economics today pointed out that they have expected, expect economic growth to be below trend this year, much less than what the government forecast, and that wages growth has stalled? Senator, the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Thank you very much uh, Mr President. I'm very pleased that Senator Sheldon uh, reads that very important information. <laughs> and I, I commend it to him, and I hope he will distribute it to his constituents uh, in the great state of, state of New South Wales. Uh, the other point I would make is that the Australian economy uh, continues to grow. It is one of just 10 uh, AAA-rated uh, credit, uh, AAA uh, uh, economies around the world. Triple uh, A rated by all of the three major credit ratings agencies. Under our government, we've created more than 1.4 million new jobs. Employment growth in 1819 was running at 2.6 per cent, compared to a budget forecast of 1.5 per cent, significantly stronger. And of course, that has underpinned uh, our uh, stronger uh, budget performance against forecasts over the last three financial years. And indeed, and indeed wages growth, real wages growth in uh, the last financial year. Uh, was uh, the strongest it's been since Labor lost government, the strongest it has been since Labor lost government. 2.3 per cent real wages growth, 1.6 per cent, 1.6 per cent CPI. Uh, so, of course, we're facing global economic headwinds. I mean, economies around the world are going backwards. Economies around the world are going backwards. The UK economy in the June quarter was shrinking. The German economy in the uh, June quarter was shrinking. The Singapore economy in the uh, June quarter was shrinking. Uh, the Australian economy, with all of the challenges we're facing internationally, with the drought, still dealing with the impact of the floods in North Queensland early in the year, we are continuing to grow. And of course, our government has a plan, us, uh, that information that the uh, Senator has just read out, to make our economy even stronger, because that is, of course, our mission. And let me tell you, let me tell you the economy is much stronger than it would have been uh, if uh, Labor had been able to impose more than $387 billion in higher taxes which would have absolutely quashed confidence uh, and harmed the economy and harmed working families all around Australia. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. The Treasurer Frydenberg has claimed that, and I quote, fundamentals of the economy are strong and that this, his government has, I quote, right policy settings. Is Deloitte Access Economics correct when it says, and I quote, the pain in our economy has been homegrown Homegrown. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And as I've already indicated, we are dealing with the impact on our economy of the drought, which is quite devastating across large parts of Australia. Large Order. Parts of Australia. We're dealing with the impact of floods. 
And indeed, we are dealing with significant global economic headwinds. Let me, let, me say, let me say it again very slowly. You went to the last election promising to increase taxes by $387 billion. What do you think that would have done to the economy, uh, to uh, wages, to jobs, on my left. to job security? It would, have, it, would have, it would have hit the economy. It would have absolutely harmed the economy. It would have harmed working Australians. Our, our plan is designed to ensure that Australians today into the future have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. Uh, and I would refer you to the RBI Governor, who made very clear uh, that he expects uh, gradual strengthening in the economy on the back of lower interest rates, lower taxes, a strong investment in infrastructure, a pick-up in the Order, resources sector. Senator Corman, and very time for the answers expired. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Deloitte Access Economics has said that we are unlikely, and I quote, to see wages accelerate or to see unemployment fall much over this coming year. Is this the stability and predictability in the economy referred to in the government's talking points? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, let me uh, assure Senator Sheldon uh, that if he uh, has a very uh, good uh, look through the information that was supplied to him, that was supplied to him, he will see how our plan uh, will deliver a stronger economy with more jobs, with stronger wages growth into the future. Certainly, stronger wages growth than would have been achieved on the back of labour higher taxes. Let me tell you, we've already we've legislated. And we were opposed by Labor every step of the way. We have legislated $300 billion in additional increases in take-home pay through our income tax relief that you oppose. $300 billion worth of money that will end up in the pockets of Australians, Order. individual Australians, that you oppose. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister explain to the Senate how a strong vocational education system is critical to running a strong economy and what steps is the Morrison government undertaking to ensure that Australia has a world-class vocational education system? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Chandler for what is a very important question. Mr. President, Senator Chandler, like those of us on this side of the chamber, understands that a strong vocational and education Order. training system in Australia is essential to a strong economy. Mr. President, we are ensuring as a government that vocational education and training in Australia is given the profile it deserves. We are committed on Order. this side of the chamber about demonstrating to the Australian people that a vet qualification is just as good as a university degree. Mr President, Order, we are Billy. committed on this side Senator of Australia McAllister. to ensuring that we have a system in place that delivers job-ready Australians with the right skills to employers. We have a $585 million skills package, which we announced in the budget and the Australian people endorsed at the most recent election, and we are now rolling that out across the country. But, Mr President, our most recent announcement is, of course, the inaugural Australian Careers Ambassador, and that is Order. Mr Scott Cam. The Prime Minister and I recently announced Scott Cam as Australia's inaugural Order, Careers Senator Ambassador. Watt. Mr President, Scott Cam, a household name, he is someone who is a former apprentice. Order, he undertook Senator an apprenticeship McAllister. in carpentry around 40 years ago. He has someone that has gone on to run his own business, employ Australians, employ other apprentices, and of course achieve success in terms of becoming a household name. What those on the other side have conveniently forgotten is he works across both sides of politics, in particular when it comes to promoting apprenticeships. And Mr President, Scott Cam is uniquely placed to highlight the value and the career opportunities and the success that can be achieved through Order, vocational Senator education Cash. and training. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How does all of this build on existing investments in the vocational education system, and why is it important to promote vocational education as an equal pathway to university? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, for many years now, university has been seen as the default expectation 
for young people who are finishing school. But of course, it's not the only pathway that is available to them. It's all about understanding the choices that are available to you as you're making important decisions in relation to your career. All too often, young Australians can be led down one path and they're not necessarily told about the value in vocational Order. education. Mr President, it was recently highlighted that 31 out of the top 50 earning Order. occupations now require left. a VET qualification. Say that again. 31 out of the top 50, the 50 top earning occupations now require a VET qualification. Mr President, the message is clear. A VET qualification can be lucrative and successful. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Is the minister aware of any consequences of failing to support vocational education? Senator Cash. Order well, on Mr. My President, left. despite, Senator despite Watt, the Senator interjections Ayers. coming from those opposite, they seem to conveniently forget that when they were last in government, they actually ripped the guts out of the vocational education and training system in Australia. Senator Let's Watt. talk about Senator Chander, Labor's legacy when it comes to vocational education and training in Australia. It was, of course, that great policy disaster. In fact, it has been described as possibly one of the biggest policy failures of all time, and that was, of course, vet fee help. What happened under vet fee help? Labor's signature policy colleagues when it comes to vocational education Order. and training in Order. Australia. What we saw was thousands of Australians, courtesy of the Labor government, received dodgy qualifications and, Mr President, significant debt. And what we had to do when we were elected to office is once again, like we do on so many occasions, step in and clean up Labor's Order. legacy. Senator Di Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the leader of the uh, government, Senator Cormann. Uh, Minister, since we were last here, the UN Climate Summit in New York resolved that countries need to lift their current targets by three to five times in order to contain global warming below two degrees. You might not be aware of it because the Prime Minister snubbed the summit to meet with a donor. Now, one of the core demands that's emerged from the protest movement that he's building right around the world is for some truth-telling. So I'm going to ask you, Minister, are you prepared to tell the truth, firstly, that you have no plan and next to no chance of meeting the weak targets that we've agreed to in Paris, despite using dodgy accounting to get there? And secondly, even if we did meet those targets, then we wouldn't come close to ensuring that we prevent the breakdown of our climate. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. The answer to the first question is that no, Senator Di Natale is wrong. Uh, we do have a plan uh, to meet our emissions reduction targets uh, that we have signed on to. Uh, in, uh, that we've signed on to in Paris, and indeed we are on track to meet and exceed our 2020 emissions reduction targets as uh, agreed to in Kyoto, and we have a plan to meet uh, the emissions reduction target uh, agreed to uh, in Paris, which is a sensible uh, target. Uh, we are focused on uh, doing everything we can to protect the environment in a way that is economically responsible, and that is what we believe yeah. the Australian people uh, expect, expect us to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, Senator Di Natale is entitled uh, to uh, his views. We will stick to our plan and we will do what is right by the Australian people. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, I want to quote you something from the International Monetary Fund's report last week. There is growing agreement between economists and scientists that the risk of catastrophic and irreversible disaster is rising, implying potentially infinite costs of unmitigated climate change, including in the extreme human extinction. Minister, do you accept the IMF's testimony, or do you believe it is another example of negative globalism? Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I refer Senator Di Natale to the proposition that uh, some of those uh, scenarios that are put forward by the IMF would lead to a, a carbon price in Australia of about a carbon tax in Australia of about seventy-five to ninety dollars a ton. And I can confirm for Senator Di Natale that this government does not support the reintroduction order. of Senator a carbon Di tax. Senator Di Natale, on a point of order. Um, Minister, uh, Mr. President, um, point of order on relevance. I, I asked 
very clearly. I read a quote out and I asked whether the government accepts that quote. I didn't ask about his opinion on a carbon price. Well, I asked him specifically about whether he accepted their testimony or whether Senator he thought Dinatale, it was negative globalism. I, I, I asked senators in the last session to be careful about raising points of order on relevance that were in fact points of order about the nature of an answer to a question not on relevance. Now, I can't instruct a minister how to answer. The minister was being directly relevant and, in fact, what the point he was just outlining, I believe he was extrapolating by, by referring to the report that you quoted. So it is entirely directly relevant. Points of order are not to go to nature of questions, Senator Di Natale. They go to whether they are directly relevant. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I, I'm aware of the report. I have uh, you know, read the uh, relevant parts of it. Uh, I can confirm again for Senator Di Natale that we don't support the proposition that Australia should uh, consider a $75 to $90 a tonne uh, carbon tax. We think it will be bad for uh, our economy. It will be bad for the environment because all we would end up doing uh, is uh, shifting, uh, shifting environmentally more efficient production into other parts of the world. We will shift jobs and shift emissions, and the world will be worse off at the same time as leaving the Australian people worse off. That is not uh, our way uh, to approach these things. That might be the Greens' way, but that will never be our way. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Well, since you raised the carbon price, on, on truth-telling, do you accept that since you abolished the carbon price, which you said would save consumers $550, that wholesale energy prices have almost doubled and that emissions are rising and that they are higher than ever in this country right now order. under your government. Order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Wong, order on my left during questions, as I called it earlier on my right. Order. Order on my left. I'll call Senator Cormann when there's order, but it is opposition time, so. Senator Wong, please lead by example. Order. Can those on the left please follow the current example of their leader? Senator Cormann. Oh, much, sorry, uh, Senator Bernardi, on a point of order. I couldn't see you behind Senator Cormann. Senator Wong is clearly accusing me of sitting with the Greens or something absurd like that. It offends me. I'd like her to withdraw that on the basis um, that it's completely I don't, inappropriate. Senator Wong, on the point of order. On the point of order, I think it is a matter, a matter of public record. The Greens sat with you to vote down the carbon tax. Okay, this is a matter for debate. This is. I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's a matter of unparliamentary language or something that requires withdrawal. This is time for traditionally the opposition and non-government parties. We are wasting your time in question time. <laughs> Senator Wong again. Senator McKim, I, I, Sen I, I, this is opposition time and crossbench time. I'm trying to ensure it's used productively. I, I was about to call Senator McKim to order. Well, I. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. As much as I enjoy this uh, conversation among Labor and the Greens, former coalition partners, uh, let me get back to the question. Let me get back to the question. Uh, firstly, uh, all of the modelling of the carbon pollution reduction scheme and the carbon tax actually showed that emissions would continue to increase, uh, assuming that the economy would continue to grow. Now, there was a period during the Labor Green administration where the economy weakened uh, quite a bit compared to what was anticipated. So emissions in that context were lower than what had been anticipated. That is, that is true. But only the Greens would argue uh, that somehow uh, removing a carbon tax hasn't actually reduced the cost of uh, generating uh, energy. I mean, of course, if you reduce a uh, government-imposed tax, uh, that uh, uh, all other things being equal reduces the cost, and indeed it has. Uh, the cost today would be higher if it wasn't for a removal of the carbon tax. And let me tell you again, uh, we have a plan to meet uh, our emissions reduction targets signed on to uh, in Paris for 2030, as we uh, have a plan to meet Order, and indeed Senator exceed Coleman, our emissions time reduction for targets for expired. 2020. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I refer to the RBA's decision to cut the cash rate to a new record low of 0.75 per cent. Last Friday, the Australian Financial Review reported, and I quote, Finance Minister Matthias Cormann has welcomed the interest rate cuts. 
Given that former Treasurer Joe Hockey once described an official cash rate more than three times as high under Labor as being beyond emergency levels, how does the minister describe the current cash rate? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, and, and I'm pleased. Not only uh, have we got, uh, you know, the uh, great senator from New South Wales uh, reading the talking points of the Prime Minister's office, we've got Senator Gallagher reading what I say uh, in the Australian <laughs> Financial Review. That is that is really good. That is really good. Now, now, in, in, in relation in relation to the official cash rate, what I said in the interview that was quoted, uh, and I stand by that, of course, is that decisions on monetary policy are entirely a matter for the Reserve Bank uh, to make assessments independently as they uh, consider uh, is uh, uh, as, as, as they consider appropriate. And you obviously got to consider the international context. You've got to consider the international context. And right now, if Australia, and that is obviously part of the judgment the Reserve Bank has made, if you uh, listen to what uh, the Reserve Bank has said in recent times, uh, if we had a, I mean, you've got to consider, and this, the Reserve Bank governor has actually said precisely this, you've got to consider what is happening uh, in a structural in a structural sense to global interest rate settings. Because if the interest rate, the official cash rate in Australia was materially higher than what it is in other parts of the world, as it turned out, as it turned out on the Labor when you put in massive fiscal stimulus, then the value of our currency would go up and our exporting businesses would be less competitive internationally. It would hurt our agricultural sector, it would hurt our resources sector, it would hurt our manufacturing sector. So the Reserve Bank, uh, of course, uh, makes these judgments independently as they see fit. And I have indeed, I have indeed welcomed, I have indeed welcomed uh, the decisions the Reserve Bank has, uh, has made. And indeed, uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy uh, are, of course, working in the same direction, uh, helping to ensure that our economy can continue to strengthen into the future in the context of very difficult global economic conditions. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I have a supplementary. Mr. Hockey said of the RBA's decision to cut interest rates to 2.5% in August 2013 when there were a few global headwinds then too, and I quote, they're not cutting interest rates because the economy is doing well. Interest rates are being cut to 50-year lows because the economy is struggling. Why is the economy performing so badly and who in the government is responsible? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, well, the, the, uh, the Australian economy continues to grow. We are into our 28th year of continuous growth. We are one of 10 AAA-rated economies, uh, AAA-rated by the three major uh, credit ratings agencies, more than 1.4 million uh, new jobs, the highest workforce participation on record, highest workforce participation on record, and wages growth. I was asked a question about wages growth before. Real wages grew by 0.7 per cent through the year to the June quarter, above the 20-year average of 0.6 per cent, and above the uh, rate of 0.4 per cent through the year growth when Labor left office. So let me say again, wages growth today is stronger than it was when Labor left office. Wages growth today, real wages growth today is stronger than the long-term average. Now, you know, we are continuing to work to build the strongest possible economy in the context of very difficult conditions globally and domestically. And you said, you said that you had difficult conditions back, back in 2012, 2013. Let me tell you, you had $190. Order, Senator the Cormann, price time of Lord, for the answer has expired. Order. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary Thank question. Thank you. Interest rates are now at record lows, and according to the Reserve Bank, growth is weaker than expected. Employment growth is likely to slow, and wages growth remains subdued, and there is little upward pressure at present. When will the government finally take responsibility and lay out a plan to support the economy? Senator Cormann. I, I, I don't think that Senator Gallagher listened to my previous answer. Wages growth through the year is actually above the 20-year average of 0.6 per cent and above the right above the right of 0.4 per cent through the year growth of when labor left off. I'm just telling you the facts. These are the facts. Now, and I also know what the RBI governor said very recently. You know what the RBI governor said? He expects, he expects the economy to gradually strengthen on the back of lower interest rates, lower taxes, continued high investment in infrastructure, pick up in the resources sector, stabilisation in the property market. Uh, and of course, the government is continuing to do everything we can to build a stronger economy through our ambitious infrastructure investment program, our ambitious free trade agenda, helping our exporting businesses uh, sell more Australian products and services all around the world, our deregulation agenda, our plans to bring the cost of energy down. We will continue to uh, do the right thing by the Australian people, and we leave the sniping to you. Senator Hanson. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. There is an, an immediate need to deal with the imbalance in bargaining power between dairy farmers and processors by legislating to make unfair contracts and, in particular, multi-year contracts which bind farmers but not processors unlawful because these farmers do not have the means to pursue these unfair contracts in court. When will we see the draft mandatory code, dairy code of practice and how long will the consultation period be in relationship to the code of practice? And will the government introduce the mandatory dairy code of practice before the end of the year, giving farmers some hope? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, Senator Hanson, and thank you for your advocacy of dairy farmers. Like you, the National Party and the Liberal Party are strong supporters of the dairy industry. And the 5,699 dairy farmers uh, that are right around our country, 98 per cent of our dairy farms are family owned and operated, and making sure they're sustainable going forward, making a profit at the farm gate is exactly what we're focused on doing. And it is why uh, we committed to introduce a dairy code of conduct. That is why that, that code has gone out for consultation twice already. That is why I am right now uh, getting the exposure draft completed so it can go out for its third and final consultation prior to the end of the year so that we can get that instilled in regulation and give our dairy farmers the security they know they need uh, when negotiating uh, contracts with processors. As I've travelled around the country, the one thing about the dairy industry is it is very different in different states. So when you're in WA, for instance, where I met with dairy farmers last week uh, with Nola Marino, they are hurting because they don't have the competition within processors to actually get uh, a decent price for their milk. But, Senator Hanson, we also need to make sure that profitability is through uh, the system. So, yes, we're getting the dairy code of conduct uh, up and running. We've got other measures to help them with standardised contracts to actually give them the financial and legal advice through uh, Dairy Australia to be able to get that level of expertise so that when they are negotiating a contract with a processor, they've got that support that they need. They're very good at producing milk, uh, and sometimes they uh, need those additional skills to get the right price. We're also, though, addressing energy and fodder and water costs because that is also the input costs that are affecting the ongoing profitability of the dairy sector. But what the dairy farmers need is competition Order. for their Senator product. McKenzie. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Milk processors are the beneficiaries of the government's delay in introducing a mandatory dairy code of practice. Will the government make sure there is a retrospective provision in the code to allow farmers to renegotiate contracts in accordance with the code once it is introduced? Senator McKenzie. Well, as I was saying, Senator Hanson, giving our farmers choice where they can sell their product is absolutely paramount for them to get a decent price. So they don't just have to go to the one or two processors in their region so they can actually sell their product to more places. Opening up new markets for our dairy industry uh, across the globe will also help them be more competitive and get a better farm uh, gate price. That's why we are unashamedly negotiating free trade agreements, even the uh, Indonesia free trade agreement. The da Australian dairy farmer has said that those tariff reductions with hopefully the order. Indonesian Senator Hanson on a point of order. My point of order is directness of the question was is there a retrospective provision in the code to allow farmers to renegotiate contracts? You've reminded the Minister of the nature of your question. She has 22 seconds remaining to answer. Senator McKenzie. Thank you. Uh, so the Australian dairy farmers saw that uh, getting the Indonesia Economic Partnership Agreement up and going would actually be worth six and a half million dollars per annum to the Australian dairy industry. So that is another uh, way we are assisting our farmers. In terms of the content of the code, it is actually based on the two consultations that we did prior to the election. Order. And Senator McKenzie, time for the answers expired. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Well, that wasn't uh, really an answer to renegotiate contracts in accordance with the code. Um, the dairy market was deregulated in 2000, but has since been re-regulated by a small number of the milk processors and the two big supermarkets. Why has the government waited until there has been a mass exodus of dairy farmers before 
realising a code of practice is required. Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, Senator Hanson, that's actually not true. Uh, our government has been taking steps to stand by our dairy farmers and the industry more broadly over many, many years. It was the competition review that we did under Professor Harper that was going to exactly the heart of this point, to actually make sure they've got market power. Getting the code in place is an important commitment we made, and we're going through getting that done. There is no hold-up whatsoever on our side to get this in place to give farmers the security they need. We also need to recognise that getting their electricity prices down is important. The Labor Party, when they were bringing in their carbon tax, forgot to model what the impact on our dairy farmers. There was going to be 15 grand per annum to keep a perishable product cold to make sure it's transported and able to be sold. So we are taking action on energy prices. We're trying to assist uh, farmers. We've got a specific package for our dairy farmers around energy costs. We'll Order. implement Senator the code McKenzie, as soon as possible. Senator McKenzie, time for the answer has expired. Senator Rennick. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate how the government's strong economy and strong budget management has helped to regenerate Australia's naval capabilities? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, and I thank uh, Senator Rennick for his uh, question and also for his support for the ADF. Uh, the Morrison government does have a very comprehensive strategy for establishing and also sustaining a strong navy to a secure Australia's security and prosperity. The rapidly evolving strategic circumstances in our own region mean that the ADF needs a strong maritime presence both within, both within and beyond our borders. We need to be more places at the same time and be capable of responding to our region. For that reason, this government is investing over $90 billion in our national shipbuilding endeavour for the Navy. We are building 57 naval vessels in Australia by Australian workers with Australian steel. But it is not just about building ships. We are also sustaining our fleet and working with industry to generate world-class naval capability to foster innovation and also to create thousands of long-term multi-generational jobs for Australian workers. We are building state-of-the-art shipyards in South Australia that will deliver the new hunter-class uh, frigates and also the attack-class submarines. The first two offshore patrol vessels are already being built in South Australia. And for the third ship, they will transfer to Henderson in Western Australia. And in Western Australia, we are also building the 21 Guardian class Pacific patrol boats that will provide our new neighbours with an enhanced maritime security capability. All of this work will support our security and create Australian job opportunities in both South Australia, West Australia, and the rest of the nation. It is a truly na national shipbuilding endeavour. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Can the minister update the Senate on how we continue to build international relationships in the naval domain? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Rennick for that uh, question. Uh, last week, I was very privileged to return to the Sea Power uh, Conference conducted by Navy. Last week, it was the 11th such uh, conference that they have held in Sydney last week, and it was a huge success. Over 3,000 uh, registered participants attended from the military, for industry and also ac academia from over 50 nations. And we all gathered to discuss the significance of sea power and also their contribution to Australia's military capability. Uh, in the keynote speech, I highlighted the vital role that our Navy plays in supporting Australia's interests in regional and also global security and stability. As I explained there, we are acquiring new cap naval capabilities because we must. Our nation needs this capability. But our Navy is also working in new ways with friends and allies to support the changing realities. In short, Navy is busier than it has ever been before. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline how the government is rebuilding Australia's naval shipbuilding industry? Senator Reynolds. <laughs> She's got a good answer. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, the sad fact is that this government has had to rebuild our naval shipbuilding capability following its destruction by those opposites after six years of cuts, failures and indecision. Labor's Australian industry content in naval shipbuilding was how much was it? 100 per cent of nothing. 
In stark contrast, the Morrison government is committed to creating a productive and globally competitive and sustainable Australian defence industry for shipbuilding. Already, work is underway to create jobs for over 15,000 Australian workers. And I saw firsthand at the Pacific 29 conference more than 600 industry stands at the conference, many of them, many of them, hundreds of them displaying Australian ingenuity and the workforce at its best. Naval shipbuilding is a truly Australian national endeavour, and this government is extraordinarily proud, Order. as I am as Senator the Minister Reynolds. of this endeavour. Senator Kitching. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Just last month, the minister said, and I quote, the government believes the UN remains central to maintaining the rules and institutions that underpin a free, open, inclusive and prosperous global order. In his speech to the Lowy Institute last week, the Prime Minister warned of, and I quote, an unaccountable internationalist bureaucracy. Was the Prime Minister referring to the United Nations? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Kitching very much for the opportunity to refer at some length to the Prime Minister's speech uh, to uh, the Lowy Institute, because it is convenient, of course, to uh, read selective uh, quotes from uh, a significant set of remarks, Mr. President, but I think it's important to take them in context. So if you were to take them in context, which is not convenient for the opposition, but if you were to take them in context, Mr. President, the Prime Minister made a number of observations. He observed, for example, that we've entered a new era of strategic competition, a not unnatural result of shifting power dynamics in our modern, more multipolar order. world and uh, globalised economy. Senator, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The question was very simple. It was whether or not, when the Prime Minister warned of, and I quote, an unaccountable internationalist bureaucracy, he was referring to the United Nations. Um, Senator Wong, I'm listening carefully to the Minister's answer. I believe it is directly relevant for the Minister to be answering the question by referring to that other contents in that very speech. I think that is directly relevant and a narrow, narrower construction than the word relevant would imply. I could, it, would, it would be helpful, Senator Pratt, if I could offer rulings that your points of order your leader has raised without your interjections. Senator Payne. Mr President, if Senator Pratt is finding it hard to get the call on the other side, we could allocate one of our questions to her, I presume. Um, but Mr President, as I was saying, as I was saying, as I was saying, well, Senator Pratt seems to be seeking the call. Senator Pratt seems to be seeking the call, Mr President. I was pointing that out. Order. So, as I was saying, Mr Order. President, the Order. Order, Senator Wong, please. Senator Cormann, uh, Senator Cormann on a point of order. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. President, Senator uh, Wong, I've got Senator under Cormann outstanding on a point of order. orders, interjections are always disorderly, but they're particularly disorderly the way they were just uh, thrown across the table by the Leader of the Opposition. Um, like, order. I would, is, I would there, ask you to call the Leader yeah, of the Senator, Opposition They are particularly order. disorderly from the centre table, where I, I, leaders are granted extra liberality in the application of the rules, and I ask them to lead by example. There is a time for debate of this after question time. Senator Payne to continue. Here, here. Thank you very much, Mr President. And the Prime Minister went on in his remarks uh, through a number of the challenges that we face in the current uh, strategic environment, Mr President. I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing for a Prime Minister to do. He also talks about the changes and the impact they have on Australia on a number of areas, on our jobs, on our environment, on our safety, on our freedom. And our freedom, Mr, order. Pro Mr. Senator, President. Senator Cormann on a point of order. Even from the Leader of the Opposition, and with all of the courtesies, interjections are disorderly, and these are particularly uncalled for interjections. And I ask you to call Senator Wong um, to order. I, 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 I will do so again. I, you correctly point out that I did call you to order, Senator Wong. I would call you to order again. Um, and I would ask all senators to obey the call to order when their name is mentioned, at least to count to 30 before they interject again. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. What I was going to say was, before the remarks to which Senator Kitching alludes, the Prime Minister talks about the impact order. Senator Wong on our on freedom. Senator Wong has raised a point of order, Senator Payne. 
I again raise a point of order of direct relevance. She can read the whole speech out as a way of avoiding answering the question, but the question is to whom was the Prime Minister referring when he talks about an unaccountable internationalist bureaucracy? Was it the United Nations? Reading the rest of the speech out, Mr President, in my submission, does not comply with the direct relevance provisions of the standing orders. Um, and on the point of order, Senator Payne. On the point of order, if Senator Wong had listened to what I was saying in my most recent uh, submission to the, to the Senate in response to Senator Kitching, I said the paragraph to which I was referring immediately preceded the paragraph to which Senator Kitching referred. They need to be considered together, Mr. President. Selective quoting is convenient for the opposition, but it's not accurate and it's not truthful, and therefore it's not unexpected from them. Order. On, on the point of order. On the point of order, Senator Wong, with respect, I believe your point of order goes to the nature of the answer. The, the issue of direct relevance does not go to the nature nor the nature of the answer, only whether the content of the answer is directly relevant. I do believe a minister providing um, an answer that referred to the speech raised in the question is directly relevant. Senator Wong. Uh, I'd ask you, Mr. President, I accept your ruling. I'd ask you to consider and take advice from the clerk, having looked at the hand side and the questions after question time, and perhaps respond to the chamber tomorrow. I'm happy to do so. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, as I was saying, the impact on our freedom that depends on our dedication to national sovereignty, the resilience of our institutions, and our protections from foreign interference. And in that context, Mr. President, the Prime Minister order. went on to Senator refer Cormann to on a point of order. I've got Senator Cormann on a point of order. Senator on, on a point of order, you've now twice ruled on points of orders so raised by Senator Wong. She is again interjecting, seeking to raise the same point of order that she previously said she accepted. Uh, I would uh, ask you uh, to call Senator Wong to order. Um, on this, I, have, I will always take a request from senators, particularly leaders, to reconsider an issue on the ruling I have given. But the ruling I have given will stand until and unless I reconsider it. So I will ask senators to cease interjecting on the same point, whether it is to me or to the minister. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I was saying, he went on to say after that paragraph, to which Senator Kitching replied, Order, referred, Senator Payne, time for the answer has, it, has expired. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Prime Minister warned against, and I quote, negative globalism that coercively seeks to mandate from an often ill defined borderless global community. Can the Minister advise the Senate? which international agreements Australia has signed up to involuntarily. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I don't believe there's any reference or implication in the Prime Minister's remarks that indicate uh, a signing up to international agreements involuntarily. Order. But what the Prime Minister does say, Mr President, is that globalism needs to facilitate. It needs to align. It needs to engage. It needs to do that rather than to direct and to centralise because an approach of that nature can corrode support for international action, joint international action. It's fair to say, Mr President, that in 2019 I think we are at point at peak commentary. That commentary is, from those opposite, from uh, multiple sources around the world, we are at a, at a point in time or an inflection in time where peak commentary is the way of the world. And Mr President, trying to navigate a path through that, trying to navigate a clear path in the national interest is what you should expect your Prime Minister and your Foreign Minister to do, and that is what we are doing. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What multilateral institutions was the Prime Minister talking about when he warned about the dangers of negative globalism? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I think the most important thing that the Prime Minister was referring to is exactly what I just said. Because we need to have institutions and we need to have an approach to globalism, as the speech says, that facilitates, aligns and engages rather than directs and centralises. I don't think that that is a provocative statement to make, Mr President. I think it is a considered statement by a Prime Minister and a considered statement by a Prime Minister who is taking a serious engagement in matters of international relations and foreign affairs. Order. I think Senator Payne's concluded her answer. Senator Wong? Answering the question. 
have concluded. Sorry. Senator Payne has concluded. Um, Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. How is the Liberal National Government building the economy through strong budget management and programs for Northern Australia, and in particular by supporting new opportunities for oil and gas development in the northwest of my home state of Western Australia? The Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Brockman for his question. He's a very proud supporter of the great resources state of Western Australia. And to maintain our strong economy, we must continue to develop the resources of our nation. And it's also important to continue to do that to help secure our nation too. In, in history and in past, we've been a proud producer of oil. In fact, less than 20 years ago, Australia produced 96 per cent of our raw petroleum needs here domestically. Now, since that time, the Bass Strait has declined in the northwest shelf as well, uh, and today we uh, now produce less than 50 per cent of our uh, raw petroleum needs. So we should look to secure more supplies, and that's exactly what uh, the federal government is doing. We're not going to find more oil unless we drill and explore and do the science you need to do to find what's underground. And right now, together with the West Australian government, the federal government is, has funded a, a drill well uh, about 214 kilometres east of Marble Bar, uh, in country I'm sure that Mr. Brockman, Senator Brockman knows well, uh, uh, that is an exciting prospect for a future oil and gas uh, frontier. Uh, the well is about the drill, the satigraphic core well is about a kilometre down. We've got about a kilometre to go. It should be done by the end of the year, with results known uh, in mid next year. Why this is exciting, Mr. President, is that the early estimates are that there could be something in the order of 860 billion barrels of oil in the Canning Basin. Now, not all of that will be recoverable, uh, but even if uh, 5 or 10 per cent can be recovered, which is often a recovery rate used in the industry, about 43 billion barrels of oil could be there. And, Mr. President, that is equivalent to the Permian Basin in the United States, which uh, the United States Geological Survey updated last year to contain 46 billion barrels of oil. So this is a world, potential world-class resource which would help not only secure Senator oil Wilson. production and reserves for this country to help our national security, but would of course help spur economic development for the great state of West Australia, which already does so well with its world-class iron ore and Senator gas. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Minister, what is the resource potential of the Canning Basin in the northwest of Western Australia, and how could this support new jobs in my home state? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, as I was saying, Mr. President, this resource is potentially uh, of a size similar to, to those of the United States. And those that have followed this or looked at this could easily see that in the United States, the development of their shale oil resources, which is the, the Canning Basin, also a shale oil resource, uh, have helped. Those resources in the U.S. have helped rekindle, rekindle uh, the manufacturing industry and jobs in the U.S. They have brought jobs back to the U.S. that had left over the last couple of decades to other countries, to countries with cheaper manufacturing. So I believe in manufacturing in this country, Mr President. I believe we should support our manufacturing sector. And anybody in this place, and I can hear a few people whispering in my ear over there, anyone in this place who says no to the development of our oil and gas resources is also saying no to manufacturing jobs in this country. If you say no to resource development, you are also saying no to Senator jobs, Wish and you are especially saying no to good, high-paying jobs in our factories across Australia. Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson, I've called you to order a num numerous times. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what else is the Liberal National Government doing to support resource development in Northern Australia? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, the, the, the well I was, uh, I was commenting on or talking about in those first two questions is being funded. It's a $5 million uh, exploratory well. It's being funded through our $100 million Exploring for the Future program. That program is all about trying to find new resources for Australia. Mr. President, the first resource find, first major mineral find in Australia was in 1859. It was found by a wombat, uh, basically, or a stockman saw a wombat kicking up some rocks. They looked a bit green. They ended up being copper. Uh, and that's pretty much how every resource has been found in this country since. Not with a wombat, not so much with a wombat, but with finding rocks and drilling from there. Our Exploring for the Future program is all about looking below the surface, using seismic testing, aeromagnetic testing to look below the surface to make new mineral finds where there's not surface mineralisation. In fact, we're doing the world's largest aeromagnetic survey right now across Western Australia and the Northern Territory. That's due to be completed soon under this program. There's already been 
major fines as part of this program, and companies are starting to invest on the back of it. It's a great initiative to help build jobs Order. and economic opportunities. Senator Australia. Canavan. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, this week is Anti Poverty Week. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister, why doesn't Australia have a national definition of poverty? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and I thank Senator Seward for her question, and, uh, and acknowledge too that it is uh, National uh, Poverty Week, and uh, want to assure this chamber and assure Senator Seward that the government takes uh, poverty very seriously. We obviously want to make sure that all Australian families enjoy a high quality of life, and that's why we're so focused on jobs and economic growth. But in relation to the specific question that the senator um, raised in relation to a measure um, of poverty, the government actively monitors trends and debates around poverty and inequality. Evidence brought forward recently by the Productivity Commission shows that uh, those most at risk of poverty are people where they don't have a, a, a jobless household. So, what we've sought to do is, rather than measuring. Uh, poverty by a household uh, by, by um, assessing them against um, other households. We believe that poverty needs to be assessed against a household's minimum needs. So we think it's very important to make sure that we target programs so that people who find themselves in poverty, because as I said, according to the Productivity Commission and many other research programs that we have seen and reports that have been uh, returned, is that people who are jobless are more likely to suffer financial stress and to suffer uh, or be at risk of poverty than those people where the families have jobs. So therefore, it is absolutely imperative that whilst we support people who are um, suffering financial distress and poverty, making sure that we fund them through a very targeted welfare system that we have, we also believe that the most important thing that we can do to move people out of poverty have you concluded your answer, Senator? Oh, no, I oh, sorry, <laughs> Senator Seward, on a point of order. Uh, point of order. I was really clear about my question. No preamble. Basically, just why don't we have a definition of poverty? And the information the minister has given us is really interesting, but it doesn't actually answer the question. Senator Seward, you reminded the minister of the specific nature of your question. She has 22 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. In specific response to your question, again, um, the government does not have a specific definition of poverty because we believe the most important thing that we can do to assess financial distress and difficult and poverty is to make sure that we assess the needs of the individual that find themselves in that situation. An assessment defining poverty by comparing it Order, to other Senator people's Rustin, incomes time serves for no purpose. Answers expired. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Under the Sustainable Development Goals, Australia has committed to halving poverty by 2030, according to national, national de definitions. How is Australia meant to meet its goal to halve poverty by 2030 if we don't actually have a national definition of poverty? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you, Senator Seward. Um, as I have, I have mentioned in my previous answer, we accept the fact that people who find themselves unemployed or without a job are far more likely to find themselves in financial distress and eventually possibly even into to poverty. And that is why our welfare system is very targeted on making sure that we do two very clear things. Firstly, we want to make sure that people who find themselves without a job have the jobs, have the pathways and break down the barriers to enable them to get into a job because we know that that is the best way of relieving poverty. But secondly, through our targeted welfare system, we are also very, very focused on making sure that we provide assistance to those people that need it. As an example, every year we provide $2 billion worth of grants to over 2,500 um, organisations to provide direct and specific services to people who find themselves in need of assistance. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Given that this is anti National Anti-Poverty Week, it's an ideal opportunity for the government to do something about the appalling rate of New Start. Will the government announce this week that they're going to raise New Start? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much to Senator Seward for her ongoing questioning. The government is absolutely focused on making sure that people who do not have a job not only have a job to go to by creation of jobs and 1.4 million jobs created over the term of this government and a plan to create just as many more going forward, 
We also have the pathways and creating the pathways through a number of programs to make sure that people who don't have a job have a pathway to get those jobs as they are created, created, I say, by the virtue of a strong economy. But the most important thing that we do is that we, we seek to break down the individual barriers that individual cohorts find themselves in getting a job. Programs like the Try, Test and Learn program that I went, met with people last Friday in Adelaide of the 19 migrant women who are going through this particular program, 18 of them have now got jobs. That's the kind of success about breaking the poverty cycle that this government is determined Order. to achieve. Senator, Rustin. Yeah. Senator Corman. Uh, I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Searle. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President. Look, I rise to take note of the answers. No, I'll rephrase that to the questions given to Senator Corbyn, not answers, uh, asked by Senators Sheldon and Gallagher. And quite clearly, well, the call, the call should be roll up, roll up, roll up. The circus is in town. My goodness me. What a schmozzle. And the question that Senator Sheldon in particular put to the Finance Minister when we read the priorities that the Prime Minister's office has sent out to all of Australia, uh, it's no wonder that the majority of Australians will sit there shaking their head thinking, what the heck have we got leading this nation? When Senator Sheldon clearly asked the Minister about um, the embarrassing leak with these uh, the speaking notes, that the government says in here that they have a plan for a, an even stronger economy. Well, I've got to be real honest with you, Madam Deputy President. It came down to what the Prime Minister said or what the Finance Minister says in question time. I would put my money on Deloitte Economics. Absolutely, Deloitte Access Economics would, would get my vote straight away when they today pointed out, and it's quoting here, that they expect economic growth to be below trend this year, much less than what the government forecasts and that wages growth has stalled. And the, the, the dribbling response we got from the minister is just, I'd like to say it's comic, but it's not funny. It is not funny. It's far from being funny. Then when Senator Sheldon went in and put a proposed a supplementary question to the finance minister, and when they in, in, their, in their talking notes here, a treasurer of Frydenberg has claimed the fundamentals of the economy are strong. Now, once again, if I had to take, who would I believe? Uh, would I believe Deloitte Access Economics or would I believe the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, when we talk about the economy and being strong or otherwise, and that his government, he says, have, quote, right policy settings? Well, Deloitte Access Economics when, you know, came out very clearly and, and they have said quite clearly so, the pain in our economy has been homegrown. It only means one thing, it's this mob here. It's been fertilised well by this mob too over the last six years, I can tell you. But I've got to say, to read, and I, you know, I'd, like to think it's a, I'd like to think this is just pretend stuff, but unfortunately there's a bunch of young kids in the Prime Minister's office who think that all the backbenchers are that dumb they have to put out stupid statements so they could all follow it in case they get bailed up in the hallway. But have a look, this is some of their plans for a stronger economy. This is what the Prime Minister's kiddies are saying to this mob over here, in case you get quizzed, see if you can blind uh, the, uh, the uh, media or blind anyone else with some, some poly words, some absolute rubbish. But one of their plans for an even stronger economy, building resilient and rewarding aspirations, makes you want to vomit listening to this, but this is what they say. Reduce the costs of doing business. And then they put stroke, energy, deregulation, finance. You ready for another here, here? Give me another here, here. Ready for this one? getting paid on time. Well, let me just spend a couple of minutes about getting paid on time. See, what this mob over there wouldn't know, Madam Deputy President, but I've been very, very busy this year hosting transport industry associations, owner drivers, state, national, the Transport Workers Union. We've all been in the one room here in Canberra, not once, twice. First time 70 odd, second time 60 odd, representing no less than 36 different organisations around Australia. And they're having a gripe about this great industry, the transport industry. And let me tell you this when Australia slows down, the first ones to affect, the first ones who feel the pain is the trucking industry. Let me tell you, I'll make that very, very clear. Not the housing, trucking, because we're the ones that cut the bricks. 
We're the ones that cut the tiles and the cement. We know what it's like. But you know they had a host of issues that they were concerned about. One was the great disrespect afforded to them by this mob over this side of the chamber when they insulted the industry, when the industry drove the recommendations and the the uh, terms of reference for a Senate inquiry into the trucking industry, the road transport industry, and each and every single one of this mob lined up dutifully and respectfully and voted against it just to slap the trucking industry on its way through. But you know, not only is their rates or are their rates shocking, no, not only now it was quoted to me on more than one occasion, and I talk with experience here because I know darn well what I'm talking about. I don't need kiddie speaking notes from someone who's spent most of their adult life watching West Wing. This is what you need to say. Not only are they struggling to get paid, but guess what one of the other biggest problems was? Getting paid on time. There is this nonsense in the transport industry that the users of transport from mining companies, the great doyen of the Liberal Party support base, not seven days, not 14 days. I went on strike to get paid for seven days. I pulled up and parked across the gate with my mates to make sure we got paid because we had bills to get paid. Where you lot, I tell you what, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120. One of the largest contracts in this nation, I won't mention who it is, has now screwed the trucking industry to 150 day trucking Thank uh, payments. Thank you, Senator Searle. Your time has expired. Senator Scar, just wait for the call. Now, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to rise to uh, take note of answers. And first, uh, if I could just respond to that last point, I absolutely agree, uh, Deputy President, that uh, our mining companies and other major suppliers need to uh, respect their suppliers, and they should not treat their suppliers as another form of finance. And so I absolutely agree with uh, the senator's point in that regard. However, there wasn't much else I agreed with. There wasn't much else I agreed with. And I, I had cause to reflect on the fact that, given the uh, PMO's note was inadvertently circulated earlier today, that the best, the best the opposition could do was to refer to a report put out by Access uh, Economics earlier today, where it referred to homegrown pain. And what are they referring to when they refer to homegrown pain? They're referring to the drought. They're referring to the drought, and they're also referring to the fact that there'd been decreases in home prices uh, over the last little period. And why wouldn't there have been decreases in home prices? As I've said in this place before, I have never seen, I have never seen such fear in the lead up to an election as I saw in my home state of Queensland, the fear at a possible Labor government. A fear of the changes to negative gearing, a fear to the changes in capital gains tax a fear to a raft of message which would have been an absolute hit to this economy. And yet, and yet the, ch the difference is quite outstanding. As the Minister for Finance referred to earlier today, what we now have is a situation where in the June quarter the real GDP grew by 0.5 per cent to be 1.4 per cent higher through the year. This is much better. This is much better than some of the other economies, some of the other countries with AAA ratings are faring in these difficult global, in, in these difficult global uh, conditions. Better than Singapore, better than Germany, better than many of our trading partners, better than many other countries which have a AAA credit rating. We're actually doing much better than many of our trading partners and other countries with AAA credit ratings. It made me reflect. Deputy President, whether or not the opposition has properly read the PMO note that was inadvertently circulated earlier today. The plan is there, our plan for an even stronger economy, building resilience and rewarding aspiration. I must say, every, every morning when I get up, the first thing I do is read the PMO note. Some people they might go for a jog for 10 kilometres, some might do yoga, some might swim laps. I read the PMO note. It's the best way. It's the best way to be invigorated for a day ahead in this place. Why? Because we're meeting the plan, the plan that's set out in the PMO's note. It actually invigorates me, Mr Deputy President, invigorates me. Lower taxes so you can keep more of what you earn. Tick. Reduce the costs of doing business. Energy, deregulation, finance, getting on paid, paid on time. Tick. Equip Australians with the skills that Australian businesses need to boost their success. Tick. Expand our trade borders. Tick. Build the infrastructure our economy needs to grow. Tick. We're on track. On track, Deputy President. 
And I must say, listening to the last contribution, it reminded me of an anecdote from the famous Lord Birkenhead, one of Winston Churchill's best friends. And when he was appearing before a judge, and the judge asked him after reading his submissions, he said, he said I must say, Mr Smith, he hadn't, uh, hadn't reached the heady heights of becoming a lord at that stage, he said, I must say, Mr Smith, after reading your submissions, I'm no, no wiser. I'm no wiser after having read your submissions. And Lord Birkenhead respond, responded, no, my lord, no wiser, but at least better informed at least better informed. So we can say today, Deputy President, that the members opposite, having read the PMO note, are at least better informed. It doesn't appear that they're much wiser, but at the very least they're better informed. And I su suggest they take the note out and they study it over the course of this week and they reflect on it because there's some great material there. It sets out the priorities of this government. It sets out the support which is being provided for drought-affected areas. It sets out the reforms which are being undertaken with respect to farm household allowance, with respect to water infrastructure. It sets out everything that this, that this government is doing in response to the Royal Commission into the ba banking industry. It, it sets out the proposals and initiatives being taken with respect to a raft of policy areas. It's all set out in that note. And the best, the best the opposition could come up with was not referring to the note in detail but actually referring to Access Deloitte's report and even then not referring to the proper context of that report. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Brown. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, I'm not sure what re how much it takes to invigorate Senator Scar, but I can tell you the morning note, I think this is called, so it probably changes once we hit afternoon just like most of the things that um, this government says, is not invigorating Australians. Because the government may talk a big game on the economy, but what we've seen today with their answers and the contributions so, thus far in this debate uh, and, with, and what is actually in their misplaced talking points is with the Deloitte report and their inaction on banks is that their talk doesn't re Re, um, reflect reality, and that's the point. That's the point in the discussion and the discussion around the comments by Deloitte. What's in the speaking notes does not reflect reality. It doesn't reflect the reality for Australians in regional areas struggling to get a job, for workers and families dealing with stagnant wages and rising costs of living for small businesses that have been promised so much by this government who claim to have their interests at heart, despite the actions showing the complete opposite. And as we've heard this morning, the latest Deloitte Access Economics business out, uh, outlook is forecast, forecasting below trend growth this financial year, growth of just 2.2 per cent, well below the government's forecast. Most damningly, uh, Mr. Uh, Madam De Deputy President, the report states, and I quote, the pain in our economy has been homegrown. It also says that we're unlikely to see wages accelerate or to see unemployment fall much over the coming year. This is terrible news for Australian workers and job seekers. Madam Deputy President, the government has failed to provide confidence to, uh, to the Senate today in the answers that we received. And Indeed, I expect to strain business and workers that it, that it has the foresight, the capacity or ability to lift growth, create jobs and boost wages. Indeed, the Deloitte report went on to say and makes it clear that the RBA has been doing all the heavy lifting with dwindling capacity to move, uh, to move if it wishes to keep some flexibility in the system for monetary po policy to deal with global shock. It's time for the government to do its part and use the levers available to it to support Australian businesses, jobs and workers and get this economy moving. Yet all we see from this government are talking points in an attempt to paint a picture so far from reality it reminds me of a song from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Rose tints my world and keeps me safe from my trouble and pain. Well, the rosy picture painted in the government's talking points may try and keep them out of trouble, but it does nothing 
to alleviate the pain experienced by Australians facing rising costs and dwindling pay. It's time the Australian people got some honesty from this government. It's time the Prime Minister and the Treasurer issued a budget update that reflects reality with update for updated forecasts. And this country is crying out for an economic plan that will reverse the collapsing confidence and finally spur along overdue wages growth. Instead, all we see is relentless wedge politics, blame shifting and embarrassingly rosy talking points. And let's make sure we never forget just how hard so many Australians are doing. This week is anti-poverty week. There are three million Australians, including 739,000 children, living below the poverty line, living on less than 50 per cent of the medium income. That's 13.2 per cent of Australians or one in six Australian children. Where is the government's plan to tackle poverty and boost incomes? All of this comes from what we see from seeing record household debt, stagnant wages and banks that are refusing to pass on cuts to interest rates. If there's one thing that Australian, Australian people know about this Liberal, Liberal government is that they simply can't be trusted when it comes to standing up to the banks. This is a government that's had 12 months to consider a Productivity Commission report on the failures of the banking competition, and this government Thank has you, done Brown. nothing. Senator Brown, your time has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Um, <clears throat> we've heard a lot today about our morning note that we all receive and read uh, voraciously, um, and certainly I'm, I would be amazed if the ALP doesn't follow a similar process. Um, because otherwise, how, how can you keep yourselves informed about what your agenda is? And certainly, we are well informed on our side of the House as to what our agenda is. And I thank you for raising the issues about what can our government do and what levers do we have in our uh, toolbox that we can use to stimulate our economy. And certainly, we are doing that because our government has a 10-year, $100 billion infrastructure pipeline that is going to stimulate our economy, create jobs and, most importantly, create jobs in regional Australia and regional New South Wales, which is getting me very excited. Because what has the team on the other side of this place done to stimulate regional economies in the past 10, 20 years? And I will say nothing. They have taken water out of our districts and they have, they have not invested in infrastructure in our regional Australia at all, whereas we've got a $100 billion pipeline that is going to see us deal with projects, both metro and regional. We have hundreds of projects underway or in the planning phase, city-shaping projects, congestion-busting projects. We've got the North Connects and the West Connects in Sydney, the M1 in Brisbane, the Melbourne Airport rail link, and I tell you, I personally cannot wait for that to open because there's nothing worse than trying to deal with peak hour traffic between Flinders Street railway station and the airport in Melbourne, Metronet in Perth, Bridgewater Bridge in Hobart, and the North South Corridor in Adelaide. They're our metro projects. They're going to address bottlenecks and traffic headaches and free up our roads and deal with urban connection, connection, congestion. We're also investing in commuter car parks to get people off our roads onto our public transport, which helps try and reduce carbon emissions from traffic, which should make the Greens very happy, and we are investing in it. And that's what we're doing. We are also investing in our regional infrastructure, we have the inland rail being constructed as we speak, which is going to get freight more conveniently, more efficiently between Melbourne and Brisbane. We're going to invest in a hub and spoke model so that we have the connections to get our regional freight to our intermodal transport hubs to get it to port far more efficiently, which is going to stimulate our regional agricultural enterprises and make us a more efficient 
economy in getting our export products to market. And most importantly, in the current environment, we are investing in water infrastructure. Just this weekend, we announced money for the New South Wales Dungowan and Wyangla dams. We are committed to significant further water infrastructure to help our nation drought-proof itself for the future. This is not limited to dams. This is also investigating water recycling, stormwater harvesting and modern technology so that our towns have secure water supplies into the future. We are delivering the funding needed to fast-track the construction of dams and this critical water infrastructure. Most importantly, however, we need the states to get on board. and That is why the Prime Minister has written to the states to ask them to prioritise infrastructure projects so that we can get this money into our economies and start stimulating our economy and creating the jobs that we know are there ready for the taking. We need to identify the skills shortages and get people into these jobs so they're off welfare. That, will, that is the best way for them to increase their household incomes is by getting off welfare and into a job. Infrastructure projects will create jobs. It will create the opportunities that people need and want across our economy and particularly in rural and regional Australia. And I'm very excited to be part of a government who is committed to delivering these projects for our, our communities across, the, ac across our economy and uh, for the future um, economic security that we'll provide. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davies. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And if you listen to the contribution from the senators opposite, you wouldn't think they've been in government for six years, would you? Um, the way that they are talking about what they are doing now, well, they've had six years to do something about it. Um, Senator Davey was talking there about building a dam in New South Wales. You've had a state Liberal National Party government in New South Wales for eight years, and they still haven't done anything about it. Uh, and when she talks about the regional economy, well, one report that didn't make the talking points, and they've come in here and they've all sucked up to the Prime Minister's office saying how they all wake up in the morning and dutifully uh, read, their, uh, read their talking points. I don't have a problem with them doing talking points, but what I do have a problem with is that the rhetoric in the talking points misses the reality. And the reality is what the Australian people are facing, and this is what people like Senator Davey need to be aware of. Uh, and let's look at the Chamber of Commerce and Industry Queensland report that's come out today that says youth unemployment has gone from 12.1 per cent in central Queensland when Labor left office in 2013 to now be 22.5 per cent under this government. So that's actually their record. So they can come in here and they can say on their victory lap the hubris, the arrogance that we've seen after they won the election and say, how good are we? But the reality of what people are facing uh, in all parts of Australia, but particularly in regional Queensland, uh, that this government is responsible for. And that's what needs to be accepted and that's what needs to be rammed home, is that this is the economy that this government has created. After six years they have been in power, this is the economy that they have created. And that's what the questions that we put in question time went to today. Uh, they went to the economic circumstances that Australians are confronted after six years of an LNP government. So it's not good enough that people in regional Queensland are having to wait so long uh, for employment. So uh, again, the Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, said that the average wait time for someone to find a job in parts of central Queensland is 10 times the wait in inner city Brisbane. Uh, and it's also not right that if someone loses their job in Mount Isa, it takes them on average 18 months to find work. Um, so this is what people in Queensland are confronting at the moment. Uh, this is the economy that this government is responsible for. Uh, but let's actually go to the questions around uh, the Deloitte Access Economic Reports today about Australia's economic challenges. And I thought the most interesting thing out of that was that uh, this made the point that these are homegrown. So weak growth, stagnant wages and unemployment are all a significant problem and they are all homegrown after, after six years of this government. So we've had uh, an LNP government for six years, we've had three prime ministers, uh, we've had three treasurers, we're actually on to our fourth one now, uh, and this is what they have been responsible for. So the leaked talking points, and this is where the rhetoric doesn't match the reality. 
Uh, they talk about how they'll keep the budget strong to guarantee the essentials uh, Australians can rely on, etc., etc. Well, there's going to come a reckoning on this when the Australian people are going to say, hang on a sec. Uh, this is what we are confronting after six years of this government. They have no plan to fix the economy. Uh, even when the Reserve Bank cut interest rates again below 1 per cent, for the first time they are a quarter of what they were during the global financial crisis. Uh, they have no plan when it comes to plummeting consumer confidence. Uh, and I'm reminded of when Joe Hockey said of the RBA decision to cut interest rates to 2.5 per cent in August 2013, they're not cutting interest rates because the economy is doing well. Interest rates are being cut to 50 years low because the economy is struggling. Well, today they're at 0.75 per cent under this government. So if that's what they were saying six years ago, uh, we know the reality of what they should be saying now. But also when we look at the Deloitte's report as well, um, what we know is that uh, the government trying to, attempting to say that the fundamentals of the economy are strong and it has the policy settings right. Well, we only need to look at that report today from Deloitte that shows that there's more that needs to be done to address weak economic growth, stagnant wages and unemployment. They also say that it's unlikely to see wages accelerate or to see unemployment fall much over the coming year. So basically what Australians can expect from this government is more of the same. They're actually not providing any of the answers that the Australian people need. Uh, all they are doing is continuing to uh, run a victory lap. The hubris and arrogance that we've seen from winning the last election, uh, they are going to continue on with that and not actually try and deal with the real challenges that are confronting the Australian people. And the Australian people are going to work Thank that you, out. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is: a motion is put by Senator Still be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I rise, rise to take note of an answer given by Senator Cormann. Now, you would think that when the IMF says that the risk of climate change is catastrophic, or catastrophic, irreversible, and rising, the government would take notice. Or when they say the costs may be infinite if we don't act now. You'd think the government would listen. You'd think when the IMF says that the risk of human extinction is real that the government would listen. You'd think that when the UN Climate Summit says that our targets that we've agreed to in Paris aren't going to do the job, that we need to lift our level of ambition and our targets need to increase by three to five times, you'd think the government would listen. You would think that when millions of people right across the world are marching hundreds of thousands of them here in Australia saying that they want action, that the government would listen. Well, sadly, the answer is the opposite. Instead of listening, what we get is fudging, deflection and lies. We heard that today. We heard that today when the response about our climate targets that we agreed to in Paris we, that we got from the minister. Firstly, Lie number one, that we've got a target of 26 to 28 per cent. No, we don't. We're using dodgy accounting to carry over credits, to, with carryover credits. It means the real target is about 15 per cent. We need four, five, six times that number to give ourselves any chance of meeting those commitments. Lie number two, that we're going to meet those targets. Well, we know that based on the current trajectory, we have next to no chance of meeting those already weak and compromised targets that the government's agreed to. Line number three, that there's a plan to deal with climate change. There is no plan. We have no energy policy. We have no climate policy. The business community are crying out because there's no certainty. So what we get are more lies, more fudging, more obfuscation and more deflection. And of course, one of the biggest lies of all, that somehow if we reorient our economy, that if we transition, that this is going to carry a huge cost on society and deliver no benefits, when we know that the opposite is true. The worst part of all of this is that when you look at the coal, oil and gas lobby working hand in glove with the government, what they've done is sabotage the incredible potential that we have as a nation to create jobs and investment to ensure that there, are long -term, there is a long-term future for people in communities who are at the front line of climate change. 
The city government that's held back, held back progress and, and knowing all the while that the technologies that, that are necessary and required to drive this change are right there at our fingertips. Because we know by increasing our level of ambition, we give ourselves a chance of turning around the breakdown of our climate that we're currently facing, and better still, that there are hundreds of thousands of jobs there for the taking right across Australia, many of them regional jobs, jobs in renewables and storage, jobs that will attract manufacturing because that's what happens when you have those technologies bringing down energy prices. Jobs in biotech and the cultivation of biomass for chemical and pharmaceutical substitution. Jobs that are being created right around the world right now in local energy efficiency, retrofits across our housing and business stock. Jobs in agriculture, in restoring and improving the land rather than depleting it. Jobs in planting trees on marginal farmland, in restoring our ravaged and depleted landscapes hundreds of thousands of jobs if we get this transition right. Instead, we have a government intent on prosecuting campaigns from almost a decade ago. Today we had the minister stating clearly no plans to introduce a carbon price. Well, remember the lie that was told at the time the carbon price was destroyed. An extra $550 in cheaper energy prices. We've seen nothing but the opposite. Energy prices up and emissions at record levels. We're about to see the renewable sector fall off an investment cliff. We've got businesses now showing the leadership so desperately lacking here in Canberra. Well, the good news is resistance is building, people across the world are taking action, and right now hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of Australians are saying enough is enough. It's time that you acted, and we're taking Thank the stand. Thank you, Senator Di Natale. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Di Natale be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.